Evening. Okay. And welcome, and thank you for being here. It is rare that I have the privilege of introducing the president, and as a warm-up, I had the honor of introducing a globally renowned, groundbreaking humanist yesterday, the first woman to translate Homer's Odyssey into English, which translation, according to The Guardian, will change our understanding of this classical masterpiece forever. I consider Father Polarza's radical announcement of his commitment to the humanities at, at his inauguration as a groundbreaking moment for this institution. His decision to embrace and elevate the stature of the humanities as an essential aspect of Scranton education is a wake-up call at a time when the humanities are often misunderstood as a fringe or a luxury. Another esteemed university president, the late Bart Giamatti of Yale, believed that, and I quote, at the heart of the humanities lies the conviction that freedom of thought is the necessary precondition for political freedom. At a time when we are challenged to keep our society free, seeing it through the lens of humanistic learning is more important than ever. As an aside, if you think that the humanities disable one for living in the real world, you should know that Bart Giamatti became the National Baseball Commissioner after leaving Yale. <laughs> Is that something that you'd like, like to do? <laughs> Back to our president. I called Father Pilar's decision about focusing on the humanities radical. I meant that, I meant that in the most positive way. Radical because it goes against some of the conventional wisdom that developing the skills for particular jobs is enough, even though those jobs may not be here to stay. He knows that it is far better to prepare students to live for others and build into their minds the capacity to deal with change and even create change. Please welcome him to the podium. Well, good evening. good evening, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here with you tonight to talk about an issue that is near and dear to me as an educator, as a Jesuit, and as a university president. I do not think it is an overstatement to claim that the role of the humanities and liberal arts in the contemporary university is the most pressing issue facing the president of any university and especially a Catholic and Jesuit university. I could and might well begin tonight by presenting a doomsday scenario. It is obvious and has been for some time that the humanities and liberal arts are on the run across the landscape of American higher education and in fact, American culture at large. The evidence for this is overwhelming and quite frankly, depressing and demoralizing at times. The number of majors in the traditional liberal arts and humanities has taken an unprecedented hit in recent years. Departments of English, history, philosophy, theology, classical and modern languages are all greatly diminished at most American colleges and universities. Hardly an issue of the Chronicle of Higher Education appears without noting the loss of resources committed to these departments. The same loss of resources applies to research opportunities in these academic disciplines. Both public and private funding for research and publication in the humanities and liberal arts is not nearly what it was even a decade ago. There are any number of factors that contribute to this crisis in American education. They are too numerous to mention and explore this evening. Too depressing as well. I trust that collectively we could identify any number of these factors. We hear them all the time. So instead of painting a very gloomy picture, of which you are already aware, I want to spend some time with you making a case for the liberal arts and humanities in our time and place, and especially here at the University of Scranton. I want to begin tonight with a little humor rather than doom and gloom. 
In fact, I think a good case can be made that a sense of humor is enhanced by the study of the liberal arts and humanities. After all, Dante, arguably Italy's most important writer and quintessential humanist, saw and wrote about life as a divine comedy. So let me introduce a little levity by sharing with you a poem by W.H. Auden. I'm going to have to take my glasses off to read the print. <laughs> Thou shalt not do as the dean pleases. Thou shalt not write thy doctor's thesis on education. Thou shalt not worship projects, or shalt thou, or thine, bow down before the administration. Thou shalt not answer questionnaires or quizzes upon world affairs, nor with compliance take any test. Thou shalt not sit with statisticians, nor commit a social science. I apologize, Dr. Dammer. <laughs> thou shalt not be on friendly terms with guys in advertising firms, nor speak with such as read the Bible for its prose, nor above all, make love to those who wash too much. Thou shalt not live within thy means, nor on plain water and raw greens. If thou must choose between the chances, choose the odd. Read the New Yorker, trust in God, and take short views. <laughs> I think tonight's topic and Auden's poem get at the very heart of the question. What is college for? What are universities for, ultimately? Of course, colleges and universities have evolved into places where students acquire information and develop skills. In our increasingly complex and interrelated world, such information and skills are undoubtedly necessary. But the acquisition of information and skills are not essentially why colleges and universities were born. I want to talk briefly about the birth of colleges and universities in two contexts. First, the birth of universities in medieval Europe, and secondly, the subsequent birth and evolution of colleges and universities in the United States. In the great cities of medieval Europe, colleges, some of which evolved into universities, were born out of the heart of the church. Many educational institutions grew out of, or in relation to, monasteries and cathedrals. These religious establishments instinctively knew that the pursuit of intellectual endeavors was inherently appropriate and necessary. The pursuit of intellectual endeavors was appropriate because the life of the mind is a gift. In fact, one of the greatest gifts of God to humanity. I think of a line from Robert Bolt's play, A Man for All Seasons. Thomas More, one of England's great humanists, explains how, quote, God made angels to show him splendor, as he made animals for their innocence and plants for their simplicity. But man he made to serve him wittily in the tangle of his mind. To serve God wittily in the tangle of our minds. Moore, as you know, was a martyr and a saint. As a martyr, he was willing to lay down his life for deeply held intellectual and spiritual convictions. He came to those convictions as a result of a lifetime of study and reflection. Study and reflection on the liberal arts and humanities. While he made his living early on as a lawyer, he rose to prominence in politics because of his learned understanding of people, of the human condition, and of the turbulent times in which he lived. He was also a great proponent for the spread of education among England's emerging middle class. Remarkably, for a 16th century man, he was a proponent of education for women. It is reputed that his oldest daughter, Margaret, was among the most sophisticated classicists in early modern England. Moore is an example of many medieval and early modern leaders who recognized that the pursuit of liberal arts and humanities was a good, even a grace, in and of itself. Moreover, they understood that this pursuit was also a way to identify and to enhance the common good. 
Fast forward to the experience of Ignatius Loyola and the first Jesuits. That inner circle of first Jesuits, including Loyola, were profoundly influenced by the humanist movement. And their importance for the founding of the Jesuit tradition of education can hardly be overestimated. Ignatius came rather late in life to the realization of the need for study. In some ways, it could be claimed that he was forced into this realization. After his conversion and filled with zeal to help souls, he began to preach publicly and direct people in his way of praying and proceeding, especially as articulated in the spiritual exercises. Now, remember, he had no license to do this work. He was not a priest. There was no Society of Jesus. He was a layman preaching publicly. As you might suspect, this work, and in the eyes of the established church hierarchy, was viewed with great suspicion. This suspicion even led as far as several unfortunate encounters with the Inquisition. Filled with the conviction that his work was of God, Ignatius returned to school in his 30s to learn Latin. Subsequently, he studied at several European universities, but found the model of education at those universities wanting. These universities were wedded to what he believed an outmoded method of teaching and learning. Instinctively, Ignatius wanted a more engaged intellectual experience, grounded especially in classical literature and philosophy. He ultimately found this experience at the University of Paris, where he met St. Francis Xavier and the other first companions, as they called themselves. So what was it about the University of Paris that captured the imaginations and won the hearts of the first Jesuits? After the last of several close encounters with the Inquisition, Ignatius determined to pursue Paris, in Paris, the studies that now seemed imperative. After a journey on foot of almost 700 miles, he arrived in Paris in February of 1528, where he was destined to stay for the next seven years. He enrolled for his first year at the Collège de Montaigu, where earlier both Erasmus and John Calvin had been students. Throughout his years in Paris, Ignatius and his companions encountered a radically new educational paradigm. The paradigm understood education as a dynamic process. The study of fundamental disciplines, liberal arts and humanities, would lead ultimately to greater focus on more sophisticated subjects. In their view, the most sophisticated of subjects was theology. But this is a fact that I find fascinating. In the earliest years, when one attended a Jesuit school. One had a class in literature every day and religion class once a week. That's a really telling fact about how imperative Ignatius and the earliest Jesuit educators were about good literacy and caring for souls. The second, I'm sorry, um, this led to the establishment of two basic kinds of educational institutions the Jesuits would ultimately operate. The first was the college, which, in which humane letters and languages and a little bit of Christian doctrine formed the curriculum. The second was the university, where the higher disciplines would be taught. Logic, metaphysics, ethics, some rudimentary sciences, mathematics, and theology. The colleges consisted of three years of grammar, then one year of poetry and history, and a third on rhetoric based on classical oratory. That was the curriculum of the first Jesuit schools. Three years of grammar, a year of poetry and history, and a year studying classical oratory. This Parisian mode, or modus Parisiensis, gave to the Jesuits an organized plan for the progress of students through increasingly complex materials and a codification of pedagogical techniques designed to elicit active response 
from the learner. It's a vast difference from the medieval model of learning, rote learning. They wanted classes to design, be designed to elicit active response from the learner. In the end, the first Jesuit schools, with their emphasis on the humanities and liberal arts, sought to move students to an inner, interior appropriation of ethical values. Not only did this new kind of intellectual endeavor change forever the history of education, it also changed the way the Jesuits saw themselves and their work. Not only, I'm, I'm sorry, perhaps the most important change that the schools wrought within the Society of Jesus was the new kind and degree of its members' engagement with the shaping of culture. Out of the schools, Jesuits came to understand themselves to have a role in the shaping of culture. Let me quote the great Jesuit historian John O'Malley. Thus began an engagement with secular culture, modest enough at first, that became a hallmark of the order and an integral part of its self-definition. That engagement was not occasional or incidental, but systematic. The Jesuits' religious mission remained basic to them, but especially as a result of the schools, they also began to see themselves as having a cultural mission. I would argue that that cultural mission of the Society of Jesus, and indeed the University of Scranton, is a result of giving pride of place to the liberal arts and humanities. Now let's consider very briefly the birth and evolution of colleges and universities in the United States. Consider what today we would call the original mission statement of America's oldest college, the first fundraising appeal in our history. It was a frank request by the founders of Harvard for financial help from fellow Puritans who had stayed home in England rather than make the journey to New England. Despite their mercenary purpose, the words are still moving almost 400 years after they were written. After God had carried us safe to New England and we had built our houses, provided necessaries for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship, and settled the civil government, the next thing we looked for and looked after was to advance learning and to perpetuate that learning to posterity. The original curriculum at Harvard and America's earliest colleges and universities was in many ways remarkably similar in some respects to the curriculum of the Jesuit schools in Europe. More than coincidence, it could be attributed to the fact that John Calvin and Ignatius Loyola studied at the same college at the University of Paris. While approximately half of Harvard's earliest graduates went into the ministry, others launched careers mostly aiming to promote the common good. The founders of Harvard, Princeton, Yale, and Dartmouth shared an appreciation for the effectiveness of an education grounded in the liberal arts and humanities. Their aim, like the aim of the earliest Jesuit educators, was ultimately the formation of an educated citizenry, a citizenry who would promote the ideals and aspirations articulated in literature, history, philosophy, theology, and especially, especially classical text. This conviction remains very much the case here at the University of Scranton and other colleges and universities who share our sense of mission and identity. Here let me cite the historian Andrew Del Banco of Columbia University. But what exactly is at stake in college? And why should it matter how much or how little goes on there? At its core, a college should be a place where young people find help for navigating the territory between adolescence and adulthood. It should provide guidance, but not coercion, for students trying to cross that treacherous terrain on their way towards self-knowledge. It should help them develop certain qualities of mind and heart requisite for effective citizenship. To my mind, I would add that college is a place where students can search for and find meaning and touch, at least occasionally, 
touch upon the transcendent. Since I started with a poem, let me end with one, one that I often share with my students at the semester's end. It's a metaphorical meditation on the life of the mind, a life of the mind that can begin in college through the study of the liberal arts and humanities. It underscores how precious are the resources available to us as we encounter life's mysteries. As you set out for Ithaca, hope the voyage is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. Lystragonians and Cyclops, angry Poseidon, don't be afraid of them. You'll never find things like that on your way, as long as you keep your thoughts raised high, as long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. Lystragonians and Cyclops, wild Poseidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul, unless your soul sets them up in front of you. Hope the voyage is a long one. May there be many a summer morning when, with what pleasure, what joy, you come into harbors seen for the first time. May you stop at Phoenician trading stations to buy fine things, mother of pearl and coral, amber and ebony, sensual perfume of every kind, as many sensual perfumes as you can. And may you visit many Egyptian cities to gather stores of knowledge from their scholars. Keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you are destined for. But do not hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years so you are old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you have gained on the way, not expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Ithaca gave you the marvelous journey. Without her, you would not have set out. She has nothing left to give you now. And if you find her poor, Ithaca won't have fooled you. Wise as you will have become, so full of experience, you will have understood by then what these Ithacas mean. Let me then, in closing, end up where I really want to stand. Dylan Thomas said in the preface of his collected works that he wrote poems for the love of man and the praise of God, and that he'd be a damn fool if he didn't. The liberal arts describe and cherish both the love and the praise. All I can add is that if we who profess these same liberal arts ever forget them, if we ever surrender our pride in them, our care for them, and forget the desperate importance they bear for our own lives and the life of this nation, even incidentally, if we ever forget that the love of human beings is also the deepest praise of God, then a lot of us are indeed damn fools. Thank you. I'd, I'd really welcome some questions and comments and conversation. So, Father. Yes. Um, I'm sure you're aware of the movement of students away from the liberal arts and humanities into more so-called functional uh, careers. What is the university doing to redirect them back into the humanities? I think there are lots of efforts going on. I met a week or so ago with a group of humanities faculty who are uh, pushing this humanities initiative, which I'm very proud of. And it was exciting to hear them talk about the ways in which they are doing exactly what you think and I think needs to be done. They're, do, they're reaching out, they're developing new courses, they're working together in interdisciplinary ways. They want to do the kind of work that I hope our new Center for the Humanities will uh, be a catalyst for. So I think there's a lot of activity on the part of our faculty here to do just that, to attract more and more students into the study of the liberal arts and humanities. It's an uphill battle, as you understand. Um, and a lot, of, again, as I said at the beginning, we could talk for hours about the pressures brought to bear on them and their families 
Uh, we live in trying times. Uh, one could argue that who hasn't lived in trying times? And I think in trying times, there's a great resource to be found in the humanities and liberal arts. Sure, I'm, I'm thrilled that we have students studying a, a full range of academic disciplines that are available to them here. But I really do believe that what makes a Scranton nurse or a Scranton accountant or a Scranton doctor or a Scranton lawyer or a Scranton computer scientist different is that they have had the opportunities to explore and get some meaning around life's great mysteries. That sets them apart. And I really think that is absolutely fundamental to who we are. And we need to put that flag in the ground and be very clear about it. I hope to do that uh, this Sunday at Open House. You know, when I talk to stu prospective students and their parents, to say there's a very solid reason for choosing this kind of education. It will make you a person, a citizen, who cares and has a heart uh, and an open mind. Uh, so I think it's on us to make this argument. But I'm happy to spend the next years of my life making it as, as clearly and as strongly as I can. At this very time, some 19 days away from the term of elections, we have a president who has described, been described by one, and you're talking about the need now, he has been described as little more than a an obnoxious pit. Is the need right now greater than ever? Absolutely. I think our, our, our nation has lost its sense and ability for civil discourse. You watch CNN, I'm a little bit of an addict and I need to wean myself off it. But I'm appalled at the way that we are talking to and about one another. And, uh, you know, that starts at the top. And, and I think a great protector against the kind of uncivil discourse that we see now is an education in the liberal arts and humanities. Now, I'm deeply worried about that and deeply worried about the effect that this way of discourse is having on our students. That they'll begin to talk to each other and about each other in, in just reprehensible and repulsive ways. Father Pilars, in, in light of where we are right now as, as a society, has there been discussion among university presidents across the country about the need for liberal arts? Or is it part of an education more focused on the humanities? Or is it strictly about dollars and cents? And you know, I, most of my exposure would be to the presidents of other Jesuit universities. Mm -hmm. and, and around that table, there's a, 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 co a collective commitment to the liberal arts and humanities. All of our schools have a curricula very much like the University of Scranton. I think one of the things we worry about is uh, the possible pressure to back off of our commitment in terms of the general education requirement. Uh, and sometimes outside accrediting bodies are pushing that agenda, right? Uh, and I, there is certainly a, a collective commitment among the Jesuit University presidents never to give in to that pressure. But the wider, I mean, the landscape of American higher education is so variegated. I mean, there are thousands of schools, each with its own mission, and, you know, some were never founded with the kinds of intentions that we're talking about here tonight. So, so I, I couldn't honestly speak to that. Father Pilar's um, I met Meyer in the right. philosophy department. I want to say thank you for your support of the humanities, also the humanities initiative. Um, and I think it's really wonderful, and I complete agreement with what you're saying and what you're promoting. I guess one question would be maybe to hear, you know, thinking about going forward, what are maybe one or two things from your end that you think that we could do as an institution or as a faculty, administration, or staff that we could you know, really to promote the humanities the way that you're talking about? Well, what I can personally do is pound every podium I stand at in front of our <laughs> alumni and benefactors and say, we need money to do this, right? Uh, this isn't going to happen without resources. And I was thrilled that the first gift we received when, upon my arrival was a million dollars for the humanities, right? Uh, and it's, it, it's a tough... <laughs> I'll, I'll pass your applause along to Jim Slattery, the, the donor. 
who, by the way, was an accounting major when he was here, but will say that he owes all of his success to the courses he took in the liberal arts and humanities. He says, you know, accounting is a skill, and when he took his first job, he had to learn the way that, whatever he worked for, PwC, or they have their own way of accounting. You have to relearn it all over again. Certainly, there are certain principles of accounting. I speak out of pure ignorance here. I don't know anything. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I think he's right. The skills uh, that students learn through the study of the humanities, and now we're talking practical. You know, I want to talk about the transcendent and the way in which hearts and minds are changed. But very practically, employers will tell you all the time they need people who can think critically, express themselves clearly, write well, work as a team. Those are the things you learn in your humanities courses. So you'll read regularly about CEOs who want to hire people who have degrees in, in God forbid, English, right? Because they'll, they'll say, we can train them to do the work that needs to be done in our particular way. But they have this great foundation that they bring with them. So I, that's what I'll do. I'm going to try to, you know, that, that first million dollars, we need to raise that many times over. Because yeah? what, what we need to do is, that, and we've been very successful, and a lot of people in this room are living evidence of this, recruit and retain excellent humanities liberal arts professors. Right? I had the best advice I ever got when I was a freshman in college was take professors, don't take courses. Right? Because a great professor can make anything interesting. And as we all know, a lousy professor can suck the life out of even the most exciting thing in the world. So I, I can't tell you how inspired I was at our lunch a week or so ago to listen to, you unfortunately got cut off on the phone due to technological challenges, but to listen to your colleagues talk about what they're doing and how excited and enthusiastic they are to do it. I think that will be an incredible factor as we move forward. You know, our students need more professors. You know, we're very fortunate in the, in the rich and robust humanities departments that we have. Right? I think, sadly, I mean, one of the things that drives me crazy is when I hear students say, I got to get my requirements out of the way. I got to get English, history, theology, philosophy out of the way. I want to say to them, cherish these opportunities. You are never again in your life very likely to have the opportunity to have this kind of conversation with the, the quality of people who are here starting with the faculty. This is one of life's richest experiences and opportunities. Do not rush through it. Don't tell me about getting it out of the way. Yeah. Uh, Lawrence. Yes. Uh, Kevin Norbert from sure, the philosophy Kevin. department. Uh, a, a quick question, Crystal. Who's, who's Ithaca is this? Oh, uh, C.P. Kafabi. Okay. It's, he's a Greek poet, so that's a translation. But Kafabi, uh, C-A-F-A-V-Y, I think. I have a bit of a meditation on this. Sure. <laughs> and that is, um, it's probably not clear from this poem, maybe not clear to many of us, but the voyage to Ithaca is a homeward journey. Right. Odysseus went away for 10 years and fought, and then it took him 10 years to get back. Right. But it's a homeward journey, and so he sees everything he learns in terms of appreciating better either the goodness or the deficiency of what he has. And I think that it's important that as we as we encourage our students to, to break barriers and, and to go out and learn something new, that they should always be trying to relate it to who, it, who and what they are, the right. community that they are in. Sure. And the homeward journey is, in part, the inward journey, too, the journey toward knowledge of self. And I've always been fascinated every time I use this poem in class. In the final line, you will have understood by then what these Ithacas plural, mean. Right. We could play around all night with what he might be suggesting there. But you're right. The, it, it's a, and he comes home to care about the, the place. You know, I, it's, a, it's a great poem to read uh, along with Tennyson's Ulysses. Right. Well, Paul, I'm, I'm grateful for the choice of the poem and for the point about coming home because Bart Giamatti's, one of his most beautiful essays on baseball and why it is the best sport. <laughs> is that it's all about coming home. Ah. <laughs> and, no, be serious. Yeah. So my, my um, uh, comment is, is prompted by the question about what university presidents are thinking about the humanities these days. And certainly with the demographic trends making recruitment so critical for so many schools that are struggling, right. many of them are thinking about dollars and cents. Sure. But I think there are a, a large amount, and you cite the Chronicle, the Chronicle is full 
of uh, university presidents making the argument for the humanities. Sure. And, um, and I'd like to comment that in, there's probably no profession that is viewed, at least the trainees viewed, as more careerist uh, as, uh, as medicine. Uh, and uh, yet, among medical school deans, there is a, a growing trend of encouraging the incorporation of the humanities into medical curriculum, uh, as we are trying to do. And the reasons for that is that they're recognizing that people trained in the liberal arts uh, have an experience with, uh, with creativity of thought, with openness to the experiences of other people, with the abil ability to articulate ideas clearly. And that, that enhances their success, whatever their career is. So I think there is a widespread acknowledgement mm -hmm. uh, about this among um, uh, leaders of universities. I just think that there are some realities that they're also dealing with. Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, to that end, in terms of uh, how people in medical fields, healthcare fields can benefit from the liberal arts, I'd recommend the play, and actually there's an HBO film version of it, Wit, uh, about a John Donne scholar who's diagnosed with cancer, and uh, she encounters a pretty rough set of doctors, um, and she comes to realize that she's been treating her students the way these doctors have been, are now treating her, and, and it's a wake-up call, and she goes back to John Donne to find the resources to, to work her way through this. Right? It's actually commonly included in medical curricula these days. That's great. That's terrific, yeah. And the HBO film is very good. Uh, Emma Thompson plays the lead role. Uh, and Robert Coles at Harvard for years, uh, a psychiatrist, worked at Harvard Medical School and regularly incorporated the study of, of literature in the courses he taught at the med school at Harvard. He has a great book called The Call of Stories in which he talks about how people can become better doctors, better nurses, better technicians if they read stories. You know? uh, because it can be trivialized, right? I remember when I was doing my, my PhD, I lived in a Jesuit community where you think they'd be appreciative of the fact that I'm doing a doctor in English. And one of, the, one of the most senior men in the, in the house would say to me all the time, so how's it going with your little stories? <laughs> he meant it to be you know, good fun, but, and, you know, and I, I think too, my, my, my mom and dad, my dad didn't go to college. I think my father's absolutely mystified by what I do all day, you know, <laughs> especially when I was writing my dissertation. He would say, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? This is work, well, go to, get, get a job, go to work, you know? Said, dad, this is work, you know? It's not understood by many. Len. Hi, Father. I, I just wanted to uh, reinforce that notion about the practicality of humane studies using an example from our own institution, Jack Walsh, once uh, one of our illustrious graduates, um, who um, was a, a founding force in ESPN, uh, mm -hmm. an, an editor of Inside uh, Sports, mm -hmm. uh, a managing editor of Rolling Stone magazine and U.S. News and World Report. He spent a year here in the Cania School as executive in residence, uh, and he majored in English yeah. at the University of Scranton. That's great. That's great. And I'm thinking, as I'm, uh, because I'm in the English uh, theater department, I'm over there in my building and thinking this guy who started his career through the education that my department gave him is over there in the Cadia School uh, telling these people how to achieve a successful life. And I just hope that he remembered his roots. That's all. He does. He, he does, and he's very proud of the fact that he majored in English here. He talks about it all the time. Great. I have another question. Sure, Maury. Uh, Maury's questions always make me a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and I've had the pleasure of having dinner many times at your home. And it's always a delight because Maury keeps, it keeps me thinking. You know? I'm ready for an after dinner drink, and Maury's got me running. <laughs> go, go ahead. <laughs> Father, my understanding of the humanities is it's human culture, and there are enumerated categories within it. Do you think that that definition should be expanded to include uh, disciplines that are in the so-called social sciences, right. like psychology? And, uh, uh, We've had some conversations science. recently here on campus about that very question. It, it, who would be included in this humanities center? I would want that to be a faculty-driven conversation. And, and I don't know enough, for, for example, about our psychology department to, ha to have an appreciation for their self-understanding 
would they want to be counted among the humanities? I think you could certainly make a case. Political science. You make, and a lot of the, those si sorts of disciplines historically grew out of humanities and, and liberal arts disciplines. Right? So in many ways, you could say political science was originally an extension of philosophy. Right? Uh, communications uh, is a hot button at a lot of places. In, in many schools, it grew out of the English department. Film. Right? I would certainly think film could be counted among the humanities. But yeah, I would like the social scientists to, to speak for themselves and raise their hand if they want to be in or, you know. I, you know, the problem with, um, Harry's smiling at me, but the, the, the problem with uh, graduate school, now I'm really waxing eloquent, is, is you get so immersed in your own discipline. And, and one of the things I took away from, from a graduate degree in English is how little I know about English. So how much less do I know about what goes on in the social sciences and what they're thinking about themselves, right? I tell students all the time, the purpose of a major, the purpose of a major is so you graduate here knowing how little you know about the subject you majored in, <laughs> right? It should, it should be a, an exercise in epistemological humility, right? So I, I don't know enough about the social sciences to, to answer that question, but I'd love to engage in the conversation. Good evening, Father. Hey, Jerry. Uh, not as much a question. I just want to put a plug in. Uh, the Myers, in particular, is shown form. form. Uh, we always have an education undergraduate and graduates, but there are a lot of us here with white hair. I just got my Iliad and Odyssey copies mm -hmm. for a proper prayer and scores. Uh, it's been such a tremendous benefit for those of us who have taken the time and come down and participated. And I hope that that's an integral part of your program ongoing. Absolutely. Because I, I think it's, you know, the old thing is you, you teach the kids and you play with the adults. Well, I think it should be almost the opposite. Right. Uh, but I want to thank you very much, in particular, <coughs> Sandra and Maury. Absolutely. And I, I'll go anywhere here. Maury, uh, so absolutely, yeah. And I'll, I'll have a, I, a, a confession to make. When this started during my, my first go around here, and I think it was Hal Bailey who, who brought the possibility to my attention. I said, well, what are we doing that for? Because I was of the mindset, well, we're here for the undergraduates and the graduate students. What's this all about? Is this a distraction, a waste of resources? I am thrilled to say I was dead wrong. Uh, this is one of the best things we've ever done. And I think the outreach to the Scranton community which we cherish, our relationship with the Scranton community, is, is really enriched by exactly these kinds of things. So as we move forward you know, in promoting the humanities, I think we have a responsibility to the city and the region to make them part of that. I and mean, one of the things we've talked a lot about is an appreciation for the liberal arts and humanities can't just start when people arrive as freshmen on this campus. How can we reach out to high schools and elementary schools where people are being, you know, they're getting gutted in, in, in these fields, right? The, the, the first cuts to go are art, music, you know, literature, libraries. We have a responsibility as a university with our mission to reach out to the community. Right? Sandra, get your budget request. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say, I didn't plan to. <laughs> Father, I think you're right that so much of this has to begin before they arrive on True. the college level. I, um, I teach uh, youngsters to play the piano, it's, it's an avocation for me, but, and I don't charge them anything, but they have to learn poetry. So you won me over when you uh, included poetry, sure. and, and it's amazing um, the love that they will get for it after a while. I have youngsters that can recite Invictus uh, from, from the beginning, and you know, some of them are 8th graders or 7th graders, that sort of thing. So I think it has to begin um, a lot earlier than when they arrive. Or, or when they're making their schedule, I was also a guidance counselor, sure. when they're making their uh, schedule in their senior year of high school. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, I, I cherish the fact that I grew up in a house where even though my, my dad never went to college, both my parents were avid readers. And as a little kid, man, I, I started to, to read because they did. I don't know that that kind of modeling goes on as much as we hope it would. Right? Way through, you know, TSLA signs were distracted from distraction by distraction. Young kids have so much coming at them all the time. 
that you know, part of the, the, the liberal arts and humanities curriculum, I think, helps develop a habit of reflection. And it is so hard for our students to develop that habit of, of reflection because the world is coming at them 24 seven and to sit down and read a book is not something they're necessarily encouraged to do or in the habit of doing. So we have a responsibility to try to help that, help that along. I say to the students around here all the time, again, Elliot's on my mind tonight, uh, we had the experience but missed the meaning. And I worry that our students here are so busy. I had dinner uh, just the other night with uh, some freshmen who won a bingo game. And I was the prize. So they had <laughs> uh, but as they started to tick off the stuff that they're involved with, I was uh, thinking in the back of my mind, when are they doing schoolwork? They're, and they, all the stuff they're doing is inherently worthwhile, but uh, are they too busy about too many things? And, and they're not spending time, they're, they're rushing through text, and you know, lectures are a distraction from whatever the else they think they should be doing around here. So it's a challenge, it really is. And the social media take up. Oh, jeez, yeah. I, had a, I was with some other Jesuit presidents uh, just sitting around having dinner, and we got into this conversation about how 25, 30, 40 years ago, university presidents were sort of public intellectuals and would weigh in on the important matters of the day. And you rarely see that anymore. Why is that? The guy sitting at the table, Mike Graham, the president of Xavier in Cincinnati, pulled out his cell phone and said, this is why. We're available 24-7. You know, uh, we, we don't have the leisure in some ways that university presidents had years ago. Uh, and that's true for not only university presidents, it's true for all of us. And let me say it's a, it was a privilege to even be able to think through what I was going to say tonight because I don't often take the time to connect with what is so dear to me. You know, I'm, I'm about reports and budgets and balance sheets. And, you know, so it's good to be back at home with this stuff. <laughs>